afternoon. My name is Len Redner, and I am delighted to act as moderator for today's webinar, which will focus on some of the important findings that came out of the Black Experience Project. I'm very pleased as well to have our two presenters, Keith Newman and Marva Wisdom, with us as we dive into the results. If you've had the time to read their short bios on our website, you'll know that we are in very capable hands. A few words before we begin. The first portion of our webinar will be given to the presentations of Keith and Marva. You'll have the opportunity to type your questions as they occur to you, but we will hold all questions until the end. While the presentation is going on, I will attempt to group the questions together to make sure we answer as many as possible. So please don't feel ignored if you don't hear your precise question asked. It's just me doing some mashups in the background. One other thing, as you are listening, uh, the presenters would like you to consider the following questions. What did you find to be the most surprising result from the study? What would you like to see happen with the study? Do you think this kind of study would be relevant in other jurisdictions? If so, which ones would you suggest? So as you ponder those questions posed to you, please type your answers uh, in the screen, in these, uh, screen provided, the Q&A section on your screen, right? And we will capture that information as well. So having said that, let's begin. The Black Experience Project began with a central question. What does it mean to be black in the GTA? Launched in 2010, the project is a research study that examines the lived experiences of individuals who self-identify as black and or of African heritage living in the greater Toronto area. Following a lengthy period of community consultation, the research phase of the project engaged more than 1,500 persons across the GTA in detailed and in-depth interviews on a variety of topics related to their experiences. Our webinar will provide an opportunity for you to hear from the project leaders who will share some of the key findings of the Black Experience Project. Have you ever wondered about Black or African identity? Have you ever wondered about the cultural values, strengths, aspirations of the black community, black families, or black individuals? Have you ever wondered what it means to be black in the GTA? Being black isn't about a single narrative. Don't talk up. Blackness to me is a mentality. It's not based on a shade. I really can't put that into words, what it means to be black. It's a rhythm. Connection to Africa, connection to each other. Toronto is a space that allows that freedom to be who you are, but not to be everything you want to be. Being black in the GTA means that you are an endangered species. Being black in the GTA has not been as evident until I've decided to wear the hijab. I mask quite frequently what island am I from? And I have to relate to them that my mother and my father, their grandparents were escaped slaves by the way of the Underground Railroad. When we got a chance, we do involve in our community back in Toronto and participate in sports events, social events, church. My master's degree was one of the best experiences of my life. Knowing that in the past that wouldn't have been wouldn't have been possible for a black woman to have gotten that far. Most of the time being gay and black and francophone, it feels good. I mean, you don't see many of that demographic in the GTA. Being a black Canadian in a very pluralistic society means always trying to the push for representation, push for inclusion, push for, you know, uh, equity. It's hard because there's a lot of judgments from people. My dad tells me we may not hear it, but it's being said. Action. One of the challenges I feel more and more now is within our own black community. We're at times feeling that we're competing against each other and not completing each other. Shadism has has been something that has affected me and my friends personally. It's something that, that hurts me deeply. People did have a problem with me here. Black people, brown people call me batty boy. For the majority of my childhood, 
was definitely challenging. I felt out of place. My beauty wasn't celebrated in any of the um, advertisements that I saw on the TV or in the magazines. We are desperately always searching for culturally relevant programs for the kids. The majority of blacks in Canada live in the GTA. So right there you have a community of people that you can identify with. I find being black has a lot of empowerment where we can uh, work together and uh, unite and become one. Ryan Burke, C23 Take One. As perverse as this is going to sound, some of the positives are at times you're deemed as the cool person, the trendsetter. This skin color, this melanin that brings us together as a community is uh, more powerful than the forces that have worked um, so long to try to destroy it. I was able to create my own movement independently. The positive thing is that we can actually mobilize and have a project like this uh, to capture the black experience. I like to be black because I look like chocolate and I love chocolate. The Black Experience Project is a groundbreaking research study that focuses on the successes, challenges, and contributions of this very diverse community. Everyone has a story. Let your voice be heard. Share your story with us. All right, uh, Lam, thank you very much. Um, the, the, my name is Keith Newman, and with my colleague, uh, Marva Wisdom, we're very pleased to invite you all uh, to this webinar about the Black Experience Project in the GTA. Um, we'd like to uh, spend the next uh, uh, bit of time uh, giving you some background on the uh, project and to run through some of the highlights. There's too much, too much here to do justice to in terms of results, and there are further details we'll point you to it. Uh, but we'd like to give you a good overview, and then we're very interested in uh, hearing your questions. Okay. Uh, I believe we're back online. My apologies for the technical problem. Uh, let's get started. So we want to start with some uh, project background and let you know a bit about what the uh, survey was about or the study. <coughs> As Len indicated, this was a major research study focusing on and with the black community. The purpose of this research was to better understand this community in terms of the opportunities, challenges, lived through the lived experience of the individuals, factors leading to success and overcoming challenges. This is not a policy-related uh, type of project, as many surveys are, but uh, the goal is to provide valuable insight and direction uh, and providing quantitative and other information that will provide guidance to those organizations that can take initiatives forward and uh, help address barriers and highlight contributions. So before we get into the study, I think it's important to give you a very brief demographic portrait of the black population in Toronto. Uh, these are uh, uh, numbers that uh, aren't that uh, uh, obvious or widespread, and I think we want to set the, the tone and the uh, foundation for uh, the survey that we did. So we want to just start with this beforehand. Um, I think just to start with the basic numbers, Okay, uh, the black population in Toronto and the CMA, the Census Metropolitan Area today, is over 400,000. Uh, this slide simply shows the growth of that population from the early 1980s, uh, where it was a little over 100,000, so the growth has been quite significant, not only in full numbers, but in the proportion of the population in the, uh, in the Toronto area. So it's now about 7% of the population, and, uh, and growing proportionally, as you can see on a uh, a fairly steady basis. I think one of the important uh, 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 trends that uh, we want to uh, uh, be mindful of is the place of the change in this population by place of birth. This is a very significant trend that's taken place over time and illustrated by this slide. Um, and basically it shows the place of birth um, across different age cohorts. And if you look at those people in the black community who are 45 and over, a majority of them have come from the Caribbean and are immigrants, uh, Caribbean or Africa, and are immigrants to Canada, immigrants to Toronto. But if you look at those that are under 25, you can see that a majority, and actually a strong majority, actually were born in Canada. So it's an important trend and change over time that has uh, fairly important implications 
for the community and which does come out in our survey results. Part of what's known generally about uh, uh, the black population is that in socioeconomic terms, they have uh, not fared as well as other parts of the, uh, of the population in Toronto. Uh, I'm showing here just some income and employment and income numbers for uh, the black community over to the left and a number of other uh, uh, parts of the population. I won't spend a lot of time going through these numbers and you can look at them in detail in our report. Uh, but what we see is that uh, Income for the uh, black community, black population is well below the uh, total population and the non visible minority population, although actually higher uh, or a bit higher than some of the other uh, ethnic uh, categories. In terms of educational attainment, uh, showing here on this slide the comparison of the black and non black uh, population in Toronto, we could see that uh, for um, uh, 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 sort of high school and, and, and below, is, the numbers are not that different. Uh, the black population is actually more likely to have a college diploma, but noticeably less likely to have a university degree. Uh, so the overall level of edu post-secondary educational attainment is not quite the same. Uh, and uh, the trend over time is that while an increasing number of uh, people from this community are getting post-secondary university degrees, they're not closing the gap quite yet. Uh, with the rest of the population. And then finally, uh, one more demographic slide, uh, just to show you a trend over time in terms of where in the greater Toronto area the uh, black population is. Uh, back in 1981, almost all of them lived in the old city of Toronto. Um, but you can see over time that that has really changed and there's an increasing growth to other regions, uh, particularly Peel region, in terms of where the population is located. Now this trend is also somewhat evident uh, across the population overall, but important to understand in part because there, uh, there tends to be an assumption uh, in the media and elsewhere that uh, the black population is centered primarily in the city. Let's turn now to, uh, to our survey. Uh, we've been asked the question why a survey. Uh, there are many issues uh, and challenges facing this community, many things to be learned many types of information that are relevant. Why would a survey be a relevant exercise or study to do? Uh, the reason we did a survey uh, is for several reasons. Uh, survey research uh, can be a powerful voice for giving, uh, a vehicle for giving voice to narratives and the lives of individuals uh, that you may not be able to get through other methods. Uh, if you focus on lived experiences, it encourages initiatives and uh, allowing um, better policies and investment in public and private resources. Um, and as, uh, as is, is well, uh, well known, surveys uh, uh, can provide credible, credible empirical evidence uh, that in many ways is more broadly accepted and, and, and stronger than anecdotes. Uh, many people learn uh, 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 through anecdotes um, and, and quantitative empirical evidence is often uh, needed uh, and useful in terms of providing a strong basis for policy and action. And finally, uh, when we do quantitative surveys uh, with a large enough sample uh, that's representative, we can understand better the differences across a diverse community by analyzing key groups such as age, gender, religion, and so forth, uh, because we have enough data from enough individuals to, to look at those numbers. So this was the basis by which uh, we chose to do, uh, to do a survey. Uh, this survey was a collective initiative of a number of organizations in the, in the GTA. Uh, the Enbrock Institute for Survey Research, where I work, is a, a, a nonprofit public uh, interest research institute that does research on various issues. Uh, but we partnered on an equal basis with a number of other leading organizations in the area, Ryerson's Diversity Institute, the United Way of Greater Toronto and York Region, the YMCA of Greater Toronto, and finally, the Gene Augustine Chair of Education Community Diaspora. So this was a collective enterprise of, uh, of these five organizations, and, uh, and we all uh, uh, played a lead role in making it happen. We also involved a large number of what we call collaborating partners. These are other organizations uh, uh, in the GTA from various sectors who uh, were attracted to the project because they saw the value uh, of this kind of research, could buy into the vision of what it could accomplish, and were ready to support the project in various ways, uh, in-kind contributions, providing venues, 
uh, talking about it and, and spreading the word. So the collaborative partners also play a very important role. And then finally, uh, projects like this require a significant number of amount of resources. Uh, and we had a number of sponsors who provided the essential funding uh, that made it possible to do it. Uh, major sponsors, TD Bank, uh, Ontario Petroleum Foundation, the Ontario government, the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. We also had a number of regional sponsors across the GTA, uh, including regional governments and police forces, who also uh, were interested in the results and felt it was important to understand uh, what the lived experience was for the black community uh, in their different areas. Uh, as Len indicated, I believe this was a study in three phases, a uh, community engagement phase, a research and design phase, and then post-study dissemination and engagement. Uh, I'm going to turn uh, the mic over to my colleague, Marva Wisdom, who was the lead in the community engagement phase, uh, to tell us a bit more about it. Marva? Thank you, Keith. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time. This time with us to learn a little bit um, about the, the it, very important research. And uh, a little bit about me. My parents um, immigrated to Canada from Jamaica in the summer of 1974. Um, it was nice and warm, and then the cold came. Nonetheless, uh, we stayed and we enjoyed Canada. And um, I, I feel like I am a child of Canada, and certainly uh, it, it was important for me in the work that I do to try to build a, a better Canada for my children and grandchildren. And so I became in, involved initially when I met Michael Adams in, uh, in, uh, back in 2010. When I was a member of the board of the Canadian Centre for Diversity, he had made a presentation around immigrants and what they contribute to Canada. I liked how respectful he was, the way he treated the data, and the way he spoke uh, from a position of the assets that immigrants bring to Canada. And I gave him my business card and the rest is history. It was a, a, a few months later, I received a call from his office and he spoke about surveys that is done by Veronix, um, such as uh, a Muslim survey and a, a really well researched and well received um, a, a project on the urban Aboriginal people study. And uh, from that project, uh, he thought uh, the black community has not been studied as necessarily that, that is in the public fora. It's certainly not information that everyone could access and disseminate and started thinking about that and thought he would check in with me who, uh, from our brief conversation. And we had a, a sort of an exploratory conversation. And what has happened um, since that conversation, I, I know Keith and I uh, worked on the prospectus and, um, and really worked and brought forward and part of my role was to speak with different leaders of the community and find out from them what it, it, it is um, that they think about doing a black study. And if one was done, would they support it? And if it was going to be done, what are the main considerations? How should we proceed? What are some challenges? What are the opportunities? Who should we be reaching out to? Who should we be mindful to not leave out? What are some of the parameters, and who is not in the room after we brought them together? We brought about 50 leaders from a broad cross section of the Black community together. Um, we had a, brought a team of volunteers together to make that happen. Our first meeting was at Ryerson University, and we worked with this group to help to ensure that we are on the right track. Um, we had a lot of information that we recorded, uh, the takeaways, uh, how we would move forward. And thankfully, this group thought that this was important research that needed to be done. And we had really great support to move forward and the outreach to collaborating partners. And he talked about the number of collaborating partners we had, it was just under 30. And from that group, we were able to really have deep conversations from a GTA and, and have different workshops with community members, hear from them, ask those questions that I mentioned to you earlier, 
record the conversations, and then the literature review that was being done in parallel, we had an opportunity then to move forward to the next step. But we call this group our trailblazers, and we revisited with them each time we had a milestone within the project so that we were on the right track. So I'll turn it over to Keith now to talk to you a little bit about phase two, which was the next step. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> Let's talk about the research itself. <clears throat> uh, this was a study that focused on the lives of individuals <clears throat> through an exploration of their experience, identities, values, and aspirations. <clears throat> me. This is not uh, what most surveys focus on, the ones that we often read about. And I think it was very important for us in this project to do this research with individuals through a respective dialogue um, in terms of how we collected the information to ensure that uh, there was respect and people were comfortable speaking with us and that we got good representation uh, from uh, voices across the community um, and that all of them are represented. And a key to this study, uh, something that again is not the typical approach for surveys and which was important to the success here, was that the black community was actively involved and in many cases driving all phases of the research, including the design, the implementation, interpretation implications at every level. Um, we made a concerted effort to uh, to bring black youth onto the research team, playing various roles uh, from design and interviewing and coding and analysis. Uh, so, and we saw that as a capacity building uh, aspect, which uh, we think will provide some dividends over time. Marva mentioned that uh, a previous study our institute conducted uh, with the urban Aboriginal population a number of years ago, it was a similar kind of lived experience project, and we used that as the foundation to, uh, to, to do this study as well. Um, because it was a, a research study, we wanted to make sure that we had appropriate expertise in terms of methodology and theory. So we brought together a, a group of leading uh, experts, academics primarily, and other people in the black community to advise us every step of the way. Uh, and what I'm showing on the screen is the, uh, the list of those individuals who served on this research advisory group. They committed a tremendous amount of time. Uh, Dr. Carl James was the chair from New York University, and uh, they, uh, they played a pivotal role in terms of helping to guide the research. Every survey uh, requires a questionnaire, um, and uh, uh, the one that we developed for this project was uh, quite involved. It took us uh, about eight months to actually put it together. Uh, we pilot tested it uh, several times to make sure that it worked. Um, it's a very lengthy uh, questionnaire, uh, about 250 question items, and these were one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews uh, with individuals uh, that averaged about an hour and a half. So. You can imagine this was a fairly uh, involved process. Um, and in addition to the many quantitative questions, there were about 40 open-ended questions where uh, the interviewers, who were all uh, primarily youth from the community, uh, posed the question. And then our participants were given the opportunity to speak about their lives and their experience. And that was recorded. And then that uh, provided the basis for much richer content. What sorts of questions and topics did we cover? Uh, the next slide uh, shows a list of 10 themes, and these were the content areas that we focused on in the 250 questions. Uh, as you can see, it was quite comprehensive. We looked at identity, experiences of community, personal aspirations and goals, education, employment, uh, health and well-being, neighborhood. Uh, it's quite uh, quite extensive, and the purpose was this was for this was we wanted to really capture the lived experience. Uh, as best we could. In fact, there were many questions that ended up on the cutting room floor uh, that would have been excellent questions as well, but we uh, realized that there was a limit to how long our interviews could go. So these were the content areas that went into uh, the research. How we did the survey, some of you may be interested uh, in knowing some of the details. Uh, the population that we defined were residents of the GTA who self-identified as black or of African heritage. Uh, it was really a matter of self-identification, and uh, that's really the best approach. Uh, we set out to get a representative sample uh, of people who identify in this way, 
and uh, we developed a snap rate frame uh, to match the population based on the current Stats Canada data. It set quotas for such things as region, age, gender, income, ethnic identification, so that our sample would, would mirror the population as much as possible. So there are no risks of these individuals from which to draw samples. So uh, we uh, developed a fairly involved recruitment strategy of uh, identifying and engaging participants using quota sampling methods with outreach uh, across the GTA through the media, word of mouth, uh, events, and other methods. Uh, because of this, it took us close to a year actually to complete, uh, complete the survey. Um, and what we ended up with uh, on this last slide is the final sample. Uh, we ended uh, with a total sample of 1,504 interviews. Uh, what we're showing here on the slide is the distribution across the Greater Toronto area. And as you can see, uh, uh, there is a, a most significant portions in the city where about half the population lives. Uh, but we have good representation in all of the other regions, with the notable exception of Halton, which has a very small uh, black population. And uh, we made a decision early on that we would not try and get a large enough sample in the Halton region that perhaps it was not realistic uh, given the numbers. So this, uh, this was the project. Uh, let me talk briefly about uh, what we found before turning things back over to Marva. Um, I mentioned that there were 10 themes of the information that we put into the survey to, to, uh, to collect this information. But we spent quite a lot of time analyzing this. And what we came out with uh, in the end uh, were a different set of themes. And there are six themes that emerged from our analysis that were uh, a little different than the themes that we went in with. The 10 themes were really the topics on the survey. The six themes that we're showing you here are really the themes that really bubbled up from the analysis and uh, what we felt were the most important areas to report on. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Marva to take you through the, uh, uh, some of the highlights of the study. And so, so the six themes that you can see on the screen this are identity, community strength and engagement, institutional interpersonal racism, experience with police services and the criminal justice system, perspectives on black youth and young adults, worlds apart, and perceptions of the black community. So the first theme, identity. With identity, diversity underpinned, uh, diversity underpinned by shared attitudes. That really is identity in a nutshell. Uh, the black population is diverse. I'm just going to get the screen up for you. The black population is diverse. And uh, uh, in terms of racial identity and ethnocultural backgrounds, there no single identity predominates. Significant interpersonal shift in background and identity from primarily Caribbean to a more diverse mix. We had a remarkable, remarkable degree of consensus on the importance of being black to one's identity and social relationships. And you'll see the data that bears that out. There's common perspective that was based partly on shared attitudes and experiences with discrimination and racism. So sometimes Difficulty and conflict brings you closer together. And so the importance of um, black identity, as you can see, resoundingly, um, the, the top two, it is important for black people to support other black people to be successful. We have 96 um, strongly agreed to agree out of 100. And in general, being black is an important part of one's identity. 97 out of 100 strongly agree or agreed. And I have a strong sense of connecting to black people in other parts of the world. That's about at 80. So the top two, if you can focus on those two, really important. But as we go all the way down through the four um, comments here in terms of identity, you'll see that they score very, very high. And the next, I think I went one too far. No, I, I, that's good. I have it here. Um, the primary term used to identify racial identity, 
This was very, very interesting in that uh, when we started with our community engagement sessions, the first conversation was what to call the research. And whether it's going to be black or African Canadian or Afrocentric, it was really quite interesting. But as you can see from the results here, um, in terms of self-identity, the word black is a unifier. In phase one, the question regarding headlines from data, we talked about what do you think that a headline should say 10 years from now if this project was successful? And the resounding question is unity in community and strength. And it starts with how we identify ourselves. So 53 out of 100 said black. And on the next slide, you will see when we talk about um, a question that was asked, it was very, really cool, the quote, and I'll just wait a second for it to come up. Here it is. Please tell me why you use this term to identify your race or racial identity. Uh, from one of our participants, what she said was, I use the term black because African-Canadian sounds peculiar to me, because African-American is so widely used. It doesn't feel right. I feel like it takes away from people who are from Africa more recently than me. I don't know that culture, nor have I any experience with it. So I don't feel comfortable saying I'm African, and therefore the word black. And the most important ethnocultural background, as you can see, uh, Keith spoke earlier about demographics and what the shift is. Um, Caribbean, over 35 to 55 plus the majority of individuals came from the Caribbean. But the younger demographic, under 35, as you can see, were either born here in Canada or came from um, Africa and different parts. So the Canadian trending up the younger age group from, from, from what you can see here, uh, it's not necessarily Caribbean. It's mainly, certainly, uh, Canadian born or from the African continent. And that's something for us to keep an eye on as we work to ensure that um, we are uh, developing a sense of belonging, especially for young people. So the next identity piece, or the next item, was community strength and engagement. I mentioned six earlier. The first was identity, and the second, community strength and engagement. For community strength and engagement, the Black Experience Project, as you can see, participants are active in their communities, much more so than other Canadians. And that was one of the pieces that was important for us. We really wanted to build this study on an asset base as opposed to a deficit base. So um, these kinds of results are really important and encouraging for the community and also an implication to the broader Canadian community. Engagement with black organizations is complementary rather than alternative to involvement with other organizations. Strength of the GTA black community includes perseverance, cultural advocacy, and the challenges facing the community, racism stereotypes, lack of unity, education, and lack of political clout. And we'll talk a little bit about um, that in numbers. So participation in organizations and group. As you can see, religious organizations and places of worship, um, it really confirms within the black community that's important and that is rated quite high. Local community organizations is second. Education and school groups uh, comes in third in terms of the number of people out of 100 that were surveyed. And then sports, recreation, uh, leagues. Political parties and advocacy groups, a little bit less, but we'll talk a little bit about that down for the, on the next slide and what that means. So political engagement by, um, by age group. There was not a large gap in following politics very or someone closely. If you look down at the graph, you will see that following politics is relatively similar across all age groups. There is a significant difference, though, between ages 18 to 24 and the 55-year-old or 35-plus in terms of voting. So whether voted in the last provincial election or voting in the last municipal election, you will see the higher level of voting is the higher age group, and the younger age group vote less, although they're very, very active politically.
just moving the graph over a little bit so that we can um, get to the next slide. And so the next item under community engagement is Friends of the GTA Black Community. You look at the first line, perseverance, resilience, and success. Community values is second, and this is these are numbers out of 100. Creativity and culture is third. So the first two items, that's a really huge difference in how uh, the community sees its strengths. And I would ask you, as you listen to this, uh, was this a surprise to you? And, and maybe that's a, an answer that you can send in, or that you can type in for later on. And the next item we asked about was the hope for the black community. What is it that you feel should happen? And what would make you feel um, comfortable that we're moving forward? So the hope for the black community, the major themes that came out was building a stronger community, culture, unity, support, and inclusiveness. So that, that unity again has come out. Uh, the strong community has come out at 61% out of 100%. And that references back to identity. Then um, a second, which is a far second, is more political advocacy. So we saw some of that there. Social consciousness, equal opportunity stronger education system and success, and then it continues on down the list. But building a stronger community far outweighs everything else. And here's some quotes from our participants. A question was asked, what gives you hope and confidence that the black community will achieve its goals? The community has tenacity, it has resilience and strength, and we need to pinpoint specific ways to galvanize support, and people need to invest. So people being politicians, companies, communities, and broader societies, we need to invest in people to improve that strength and resiliency so that we can move forward. And this is from a female um, participant from New York Region. And then another participant from New York Region, we're realizing the importance of black roles, there are a few black leaders running, and this would be referring to elections, and of course we have two elections coming up um, in 2018. We have to demonstrate for ourselves and take control of ourselves, which will encourage others to do so. Mobilizing and growth within our groups. And I, I might reference Operation Black Vote has looked at some of these surveys as well, and it's an organization that has started up again to try to reach out to the community in looking at some of the results from this, um, from this survey, from this study. And so a question was asked in terms of the greatest challenge facing the black community. These responses are unprompted responses. And the greatest challenges, challenge by far, racism and stereotypes. Distrust, lack of unity comes in a close second. And then internalized racism and lack of confidence. So racism really plays a role internally within the community and externally in how others relate to the community. And then it continues on about lack of education and ambition, um, lack of government support, lack of political and economic clout. And some of these continue to be consistent through the, through the survey. And we have another quote, another two quotes from participants as well. What do you believe are the biggest challenges for the black community in achieving these goals? In their words, and sometimes narratives are as important as the numbers. Intense divides among black people and self-interest. It is very easy to turn a black person against another person. We have a lack of vision. And so for this, what that comes out is that that need and that call and that wanting the community to unite in moving forward together. Also recognizing the diversity of the community. And then another um, response was that <laughs> systemic racism, the biggest challenge in achieving goals, historical traumas and beliefs, keep many people trapped in certain mindsets. It's hard to break the cycle. No mental or emotional support in our communities or families. And certainly, um, this individual that responds, uh, if, there, if there are supports within communities, it's where are they and how do we find it? And that would be a next step 
in terms of the research survey. And so we'll move now to the third item, which is institutional and interpersonal racism. And that will come up on your screen very shortly. And then we speak about discrimination due to race and underlying and common experience across the GTA population. Participants from all backgrounds are affected. Those with lower socioeconomic status are most disadvantaged, but income does not insulate from racism. I'm going to repeat that income does not insulate from racism. Black students experience challenges in high school. Presence of black teachers make a difference. And the last point, personal impact of racism varies. Some are bothered and some are inspired to rise to the challenge. And so let's talk about the numbers then that bear out some of these summary points uh, that came out of the survey. So experiencing unfair treatment because you are black. As you can see, the first two men, it's similar for both genders. Approximately 66 men and 67 women experience racism frequently or occasionally. And this is 66 or 67 out of 100. And then if you go down a little bit farther, if you look at income, and you look on the left and the middle side, frequently or occasionally, less than 20,000 in income per year, 70, 20,000 to 40,000, 68, 40 to 70,000, 70, 70,000 to 100,000, this is household income, 63 out of 100 experience unfair treatment, and then 100 or more, 65 out of 100 experience unfair treatment. So there's a a very, very minute difference um, among income and unfair treatment. If anything, it, it is quite similar that income is not an insulator of uh, racism and stereotypes. And then we move on to the next slide where we're going to talk about day-to-day -day personal experiences because of race. Uh, just over 50%, as you can see, um, all along, experienced day-to-day experienced -day personal uh, racism. If you look all the way down to the second last, treated in, in overtly friendly or superficial way, that is sort of the highest. Everything else is probably around the 50% um, mark of the respondents or, or 50 of 100 respondents or pretty close to that. But uh, being treated superficially or overtly friendly at 78%. Sometimes we don't know that others notice uh, that, we, that there's a superficial way of interacting. And sometimes it could mean that the other person is a little bit nervous or don't know how to respond. But this is something for us to look at. And then if we move to the next slide, we're going to talk about the, our high school um, students and their experiences. Overall, uh, we have found that the significance of black teachers in the classroom makes a difference on how the, the pupil uh, feels about their high school experience, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. So all the way through, you'll see down the first column, self-accepted by the students at school, most or some teacher, when some, most or some teachers were black, a full 91% felt accepted by the students at the school. And then the next column, felt you received a good education when most or some teachers were black, a good 84% solidly um, felt that they got a better education. And so right across the column, you can see that it makes a difference when teachers, there are teachers in high school that reflect the individual's identity, certainly within the black community. And if we move to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Bill can you talk about institutional interpersonal racism, but talk this time about the, the biggest challenges in finding meaningful employment. And the slide is coming up in just a moment. It's a slight delay. Sorry about that. And so these were unprompted responses in terms of finding meaningful employment, finding opportunities um, in doing job search, 31 out, out of 100, uh, having the right qualification experience, there are 26 that responded that this was a challenge. Discrimination and bias due to my race, uh, 19 out of 100 said this was a, a, 
a, a problem in finding meaningful employment. So if we look at the previous slide, we'll see that once a person is either employed and in the interaction, uh, discrimination is an issue, but in terms of actually when they are out looking and trying to find employment, it doesn't seem to have been as big of an obstacle as may have expect, been expected. And so on the next, how does your day-to-day -day experience of discrimination bother you? As you can see overall, um, about 28 out of 100 says it bothers me a lot down to 19 say it doesn't bother me. So this is probably just a, uh, uh, just a quick reflection of how people feel that uh, racism and discrimination has bothered them in their day-to-day -day activities. And so the next item we're gonna talk about is microaggression. It's sort of a new word that you're hearing a lot now, people talking about microaggression. And I spoke early, uh, earlier in one of the slides about uh, folks feeling that others treated them as, as superficially, sort of pretending, or, or maybe in some cases uh, uh, people feel that they are uh, treated in a condescending kind of way or in a patriarchal kind of way. And so the microaggression within the system, how it impacts the overall satisfaction of life, systemic experience with discrimination, high life satisfaction at 21, medium life satisfaction at 31, and common experience with discrimination um, and certainly microaggression on the day-to-day -day basis, uh, it, it becomes an issue. Occasional experience with discrimination is, is, is uh, also an issue. So moving forward to frequent personal experiences because of race. We're moving to the next slide and we're almost there. There you go. So it's frequent personal experience because of race, and this is by adequacy of household and income. And this is something that was very, very interesting. I think it, it, you talk to most black people, they, they will say yes, and they will definitely confirm, uh, confirm this. But it is interesting that we now have empirical research data that is supporting what has been more of an anecdote or more of a sort of word of mouth of people sharing their experience. So perception experience based on one's income level. Been observed or followed in public place, they ignored or not given service in a restaurant, treated rudely or disrespectfully. So as you can see, when income is good enough and folks can pay for it, their perception of how they're treated, um, it makes a difference. So the higher income seems to not have any feel the impact quite as much. I'm going to go through this very quickly because I know that um, we have uh, uh, we have a fair bit to, to cover, but we have very little time left. So the next item is experience of police service and the criminal justice system. Across institutions, it is it has made um, a, a big difference around how people feel and how they're treated um, in the criminal justice system or certainly their experiences with the police. It is most problematic for the black community. Participants have had both positive and negative outcomes with the police, but the latter is more common. Negative experiences are most widely experienced by men, ages 25 to 44, but commonplace across the population, regardless of socioeconomic status. Participants distinguish between overall performance of the police and how they treat black people. So, the personal experience of police in community of the GTA. <laughs> Have you ever had experience of uh, getting stopped in public place by the police? As you can see, in percentage-wise, 55% of the population are of that 55% that experience getting stopped by police, a full 79, 79% of that group are men ages 25 to 44%. Socializing with police at social and cultural functions, about 53% said they have, and about 64% uh, are ages 25 to 44 males. Being held by police is sort of reversed where it's higher, which is good. Um, and the list continues down. So I'm just going to focus on the top piece of the number of black males that are stopped by police. 
it is significant and we've heard that and now we have data to back that up. Personal experience with police. Income is not insulator, and we talked about that a little bit earlier on. It is not, uh, there's no real broad variation in folks who are being harassed whether their income is higher or lower. And performance of local police force, there's a fairly good response in, sh in, in, in how they feel that the police is performing broadly in their role in, in protecting citizens. However, if you look on the right-hand column, you will see that it's reversed as related to black people. Um, high percentage, 54 out of 100, says that treating black people fairly is not something that is happening within the police force. Although they feel that generally, uh, the police has a role to play and is doing a good job um, in protecting citizens. Personal involvement with the criminal justice system. I'm just going to go through this a little bit, and um, I'm just going to go by this very quickly. And it, the percentage of black, again, the issue has to do with black males, 25 to 44, a significant concern in, in the stopping by police. And then, of course, um, uh, the, the issue of, of being involved with the criminal justice system. And then treatment by the criminal justice system. Those with person, personal involvement within the past year um, felt that they were treated unfairly because they were black. That's very high. That 71% is the definitive yes. 21 has said likely. And here's a quote from one of uh, our participants. What one piece of advice or comment would you personally like to give to the chief of police in your region? And here's the comment, learn to see us as people and not hide behind the institution of the police. Not everyone is to be treated suspiciously. Something in their training that causes them to treat us with such lack of respect and in dehumanizing ways. So an opportunity here for the police to receive this kind of feedback and then um, with this feedback perhaps to make some adjustments around the training. And certainly as you, could have, you, you would have seen from Keith's introduction, we have several of our police services who participated as supporters of this, um, uh, of this survey. So perspective on black youth, black youth and generational change. Young black adults are majority Canadian born, as we have said earlier. Younger generation dis distinguished by more diverse identities and their friendship networks. And they also have higher education attainment. Our youth have distinct views from about the community's strengths and its challenges. And black youth are more, not less, affected by racism. This is, has been another big aha moment. One would think that over the years and all the work that has been done around um, in fighting racism, that black youth would feel um, much more, um, much less affected by racism. But no, they are more affected by racism. And then they talked about the, the biggest opportunity for black youth today. These were unprompted responses and by far education system, community programs, leadership and mentorship were the top three that are um, assets and, and big opportunities for black youth. And the next slide has come up, unique attributes of the GTA black community. These are all unprompted responses. So the optimism that we talked about, the black youth are much more optimistic. So ages 16 to 44, although 44 is not youth, but certainly through that age group starting at 16, they see diversity as a strength, especially, um, certainly, especially the younger demographics. The seniors, 55 and plus, um, they, they see diversity not as much as the strength as the black youth does. So if you look across the bars here, um, diversity in backgrounds, you'll see how, how it's rated and, and see our, our young people and the hopefulness that they have for our community. And racism and stereotypes as the greatest challenges from the community. Um, what I'm going to do is um, I'm just going to read to you the quote that is coming up. It's going to be the slide next, but I think it really speaks to, uh, to this here. 
What do you see as the most notable challenges facing Black youth as they grow up and prepare themselves to be part of today's society? And the response is the government system. It wasn't meant for Black youth to succeed, even as much as we exceed expectations. Those constant barriers and all of the no's we endure. Also, the generational cycle of being broken down, so many broken spirits and dreams. Parents are finding it hard to motivate their youth because they have endured hardships themselves. And so if you look at this, at, at, at this measurement, at this data, um, we're looking at more than, than 50% of our black youth in terms of racism, stereotypes, and challenges. More than 50% face that uh, from 16 to 24. 25 to 34, less so. And then seniors, of course, as we go down to the end of the spectrum, even less so. Uh, and the last item um, that we're gonna talk about is worlds apart and perceptions of the black community. Large gap between how black participants see themselves and their hope for the community and how they feel they're seen by non-black people. Participants take great pride in the distinctiveness of black people and the community's contributions to the GTA, whether it be culture, diversity, heritage, leadership, education, or advocacy. Almost everyone believes non-black people hold negative impressions of black people and have seen little change in the past decade. The challenge Big challenge is the media's portrayal of the black community, which is seen as mostly negative and driven by stereotypes. So if we look at this um, slide, the black community's most important contribution to the GTA, culture, social influence, 67%. Community involvement and leadership is 36%. And certainly we saw that when we talked about community engagement. And then we talk, we'll talk a little bit about the basic hope and confident and confidence in achieving common goals, the basis of hope rather, and confidence of achieving uh, community goals. And this again, unprompted response is our resilience and our strength, and also effective leadership and mentorship, and again, unity, working together. And what I'll do, I'm just gonna go very quickly to the media slide um, to make it a little bit, uh, a little bit more, more timely so that you have loads and loads of time for questions. I'm going to skip this slide. And so for the media's portrayal on, on the unprompted responses, in what ways are black people portrayed accurately in the media as you see it? And the first response is they are not in fact portrayed accurately at all. And a full quarter <laughs> and that's a full quarter, so 25% of people said we're not portrayed accurately. And they said, though, that live events, for example, they see people being portrayed in live events, and that scored fairly well. Portrays of leaders or individual success stories, not very much. Um, positive individual traits and efforts, not very much at all, at 6%. So the media plays a really big role here, as people see it. And now the next column, it talks about in what ways are black people portrayed inaccurately in the media as you see it. And huge exaggeration of criminal activities, uh, portrayed as uneducated, lazy, or lack of ambition, and certainly stereotypes or general misrepresentation are the top three. So a lot of work to be done here, a lot of things identified in terms of how we move forward as a community and how others learn about the black community. And what does broader society, <laughs> what should broader society understand about black people? And I think it sums it up, our common humanity is the most common sentiment. Black people are the same as everyone else. And that media portrayal is by and large inaccurate. A diverse people, not all the same, 30, and then history has affected our people's place in society. So if you look at the top uh, numbers uh, from 100, full 57, black people are the same as everyone else. And so I'm gonna close with a quote um, from one of our participants and what uh, she said was, uh, 
what her experience was in the cafeteria was very interesting. What do you believe are the most common beliefs that non-Black people hold about Black people? And she said, people sometimes are still afraid. She said, in my cafeteria, there's a table where all the Black people sit, and they call that table Africa. We thought that was really hilarious. A student did a small sample study of school cliques, of which clique would be the most accepting of newcomers. The hypothesis was that Africa would be the least accepting. Results showed that Africa were, were the most accepting, welcoming of several cliques, surprising most students and teaching staff. And so that really tells, uh, uh, goes to the next slide with the comment. Uh, is there something that you wish the broader society understood about, about black people that we too are human beings and understand that to the depth of what it truly is so that we can all be treated equally? They need to know black is beautiful, simply put. And I'll turn it over now to Keith for next steps. <clears throat> Thank you, Barbara. Uh, we're basically done, but we do want to tell you uh, what's happened uh, since we completed this study. Okay, next. So just very briefly in terms of what happened, uh, we completed the study earlier this year and there was a, a major public release in July uh, where we released a final report um, and a launch video which we recommend that you have a look at. Uh, we have a dedicated website for the project, www.theblackexperienceproject.ca. And uh, quite a lot of information about the study is available on that website, uh, including the report, details, uh, results, uh, videos, and so forth. Um, and uh, certainly uh, you can get more details from that. Um, there have been and will be future uh, public forums and presentations where uh, we will be presenting the results. And the website will uh, highlight those opportunities. Um, and I think it's important to point out that uh, the work that we've done is uh, in many ways completed. Uh, but our partners and sponsors and collaborating partners and other organizations are now going to be taking the work forward and looking at it more deeply, involving the community, doing more research, uh, and giving more thought to what the findings mean and where we go forward. So uh, there's quite a lot that can be done from this research, um, and it's intended to be open source and available. Uh, those individuals and organizations that want to get the actual detailed data files uh, that will be publicly available through the Jean Augustine Chair at York University, uh, where the research will be permanently ha housed in archive, uh, so that it's available uh, well into the future. Uh, with that, we are going to conclude our formal presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and patience, and we look forward now to uh, uh, hearing about your questions and seeing how well we can do to answer them. Over to you, Len. Thank, thank you very much, Keith, and thank you very much, Marva. Uh, there were there were a few questions uh, that did come in, uh, but just I suppose first to answer one of the questions that you posed. Uh, one of our participants uh, said that they thought that it would be very useful to have this study repeated in Halifax. So uh, don't put away your uh, your data sets yet; uh, they may be needed elsewhere. Um, one other, uh, one other uh, participant asked if it would be possible uh, for this PowerPoint presentation to be shared. Uh, I don't know if it's proprietary, but would it be possible to post it on uh, the Race Relations Foundation's website? Well, that's a very easy answer for that. Uh, the presentation can be available. Uh, we will be posting it on our website, and we'd uh, very much appreciate the, uh, the CRF to post it as well. Excellent. All right. So I so I hope everyone is paying attention to that. You will have the opportunity uh, to make this presentation your very own. One of the uh, a couple of folks commented on uh, the slide uh, that talked about voting patterns within within the community. Uh, one person said that they were surprised uh, that it was such a low turnout for youth voting. Uh, a question that occurred to someone else was. Uh, how typical or unusual or usual is it uh, for this kind of voting pattern to appear uh, where you see uh, much lower activity uh, for, for the young people than for the older folks? 
Uh, let me answer that question. I think actually it's a very common pattern that we see across the population, not and not necessarily just in Canada. Uh, I think if you look at the, uh, at the uh, voter and election surveys uh, that have been done in this country, uh, you can see that uh, youth are less likely to vote than, than older Canadians. Um, that's been a pattern that actually has been increasing federally uh, for the last number of years, although changed a bit in the last federal election. I think that uh, part of what we know is that uh, uh, there's a tendency for older people to think of voting as an obligation, a duty of sorts, and younger generations are more likely to see it as a matter of choice. Um, and we know from other studies that uh, uh, youth uh, are less likely to vote uh, but they are also very engaged in political and civic issues, but they may choose other ways to do it. Okay, Ex excellent, thank you. Um, in terms of the, uh, this uh, project was obviously a tremendous uh, amount of work and energy by, by many people. Um, what, were, uh, what was the biggest challenge, though, that you faced in completing this study? I think the biggest challenge that we face in completing the study is, number one, um, it was a challenge and an opportunity. And that is really ensuring that we're capturing the broad cross-section of the black community, um, that we are really vigilant in terms of our outreach, and ensuring that uh, the broadest representative voices are heard as we move forward within the study at each at, Area of the study, each at each milestone of the study. The study started off, as I said, in 2011, and it took seven years to complete. It was three years of community engagement to make sure that we're doing it right and that we are um, ensuring that we have the right people on side. And when you do a study over a seven-year period, there are changes in between. People move on, and then you have to staff up again to make sure that you are, are moving and continuing going forward. And of course, we had a number of partners, and so we also had to look at our collaborating partners and look at our, our lead partners as well, and our sponsors, and look and, and making sure that they are connected um, to the study and that they are on board and that they are really um, in there with us as we move forward over this uh, the six to seven year period of the study. That was hard. Certainly, um, Keith mentioned that Halton, the sample size for Halton was not going to be big enough, but we were still going to get other information from, from Halton, making sure that we have a, a good enough sample size for all of these questions so that the, the survey results, when they come out, that they would be something that, that was strong. And, and I'll let Keith talk a yeah. little bit more about that. Let me just add, add to that. I think one of the other challenges related to that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, convincing not only the community generally, but individual, uh, individuals in this community to participate in a survey like this. I think a lot of what we heard in the beginning was that there have been many surveys, and many studies of the black community, um, and people have participated, and they've seen uh, no positive results, they see no impact, they see no outcome. And so here's yet another study, and how would this one be different? So we really had to make a very convincing case uh, uh, that this study was in fact different. Uh, different partly because uh, much of the focus and impetus for this project came from the community, not from outside. Um, and that the study in many ways was driven by individuals and groups within the community and was asking questions that had never been asked on surveys before about identity and aspirations and, and topics such as that. So. That was certainly a hurdle that we had to get over, and, and I think we did, but it took time. And I might even add to that, uh, again, that the momentum when you're doing a study over a six-year period, so keeping up the momentum and keep people really interested and engaged. Okay, thank, thank you very much for that. Now, it, of course, it was a very uh, detailed presentation, and I'm sure uh, at some point you may have been concerned that people might not have been paying as close attention as they could. However, this next question will reassure you. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, one of our participants one asked why do the responses on some of the charts, for example, the media charts, total more than 100%. So not only were they paying attention, but their arithmetic skills are just absolutely mad. 
Well, that, that's great. I think uh, we're glad to hear that. I think the short answer is that uh, on some of the questions, people could give more than one responses. Uh, we invited multiple responses. So if people gave two or three different responses and you total them all up, it would be more than 100%. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, another question from a participant, uh, and I'll just read it. I'll read it from the Q&A box. I live outside of the GTA uh, in Guelph, Ontario. What do the stats say about the population of black people outside the GTA in the province? Not only Halifax has historic black population. For example, so does Windsor. Um, that's a really good question. And since I live in Guelph and have lived in Guelph for over 30 years, um, uh, thank you, Guelphites, uh, for tuning in to this. Uh, we, this, this survey, Guelph is outside of the scope of this because this, this survey, the parameters of the survey geographically was the GTA. Um, and it doesn't mean that we can't look at the population of Guelph and take a look at some of uh, the questions that were asked here and see how that might be reflected. Indeed, if you are from Guelph, you will recall um, that a few years ago, five years ago, we purchased an old British Methodist Episcopal Church, and it's now called Heritage Hall. And while we were working on acquiring that building, we, we also um, did a, a whole lot of research and learned that about 25% of the population of Guelph back in the 1800s up to the 1920s or 30s was black. And some, uh, and this is Guelph and Wellington County, not just Guelph itself. And learned a lot about what their life was like, um, what their strengths were, um, how they worshipped and where, and the kind of uh, discrimination, racism they 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 face, as well as who the allies are during that time. So indeed, um, black population right across the Underground Railroad terminus, but going all the way from Niagara Falls through down to Windsor. There are a lot of these kinds of buildings and a lot of parsonages attached to some of those buildings where there are historic black populations, including, um, you know, burial um, spaces or cemeteries. And uh, one of the things in doing this project and in working on the project to acquire that building is how we can come up with a strategy to ensure that these heritage sites are safeguarded or at least that they're recognized and acknowledged consistently um, as a heritage site. And there is an organization now, a national organization. They had their first summit um, with the Mikhail Jean Foundation last week. It's called the National Black Leaders Congress. Um, and, and they would be able to work on some of this kind of advocacy to support people in those local areas who feel that people have forgotten that it was, a, was and is a black population there. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Just to add to that, I think that we had to make some decisions about what part of the population to cover. Uh, we chose the GTA partly because it's about 50% of the black population in the entire country. So, you know, uh, we had to draw boundaries somewhere. But it's been our hope from the beginning and continues to be our hope that once the study is finished and shared, that uh, other organizations will launch similar research in other communities like Guelph, Halifax, Montreal, and so forth. And we've already had some expressions of interest. And we will do what we can to facilitate and help further research like this be done in those other communities. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, one last question. I'm going to uh, exercise moderator's prerogative and mm -hmm. uh, send back to you one of the questions that you posed to the audience, and that is, what did you find to be the most surprising result from the study? Well, for me, the most uh, surprising result is that um, our youth um, have felt the incidence of racism much more so than older adults, that no change has really happened from their perspective. That is shocking to me and, and sad at the same time. But it's also hopeful that they have had an avenue and opportunity to speak out. And we noticed back when this study started, there was nothing like Black Lives Matter or other organizations that 
um, where the youth are really pushing boundaries and pushing for change to be made. And so I am hopeful that this will change in the next year or so and that their sense of belonging as Canadians will improve and will increase. Uh, with more action being taken and some of this information going forward to various institutions, organizations, government bodies to make change happen and that a transformation will happen within the community and outside of the community. Uh, and I, I think just to add to that, I think one of the surprises for me was uh, the, the community's uh, views about police in their area. Um, we know, and it was not surprising that uh, this community is not well treated by uh, uh, by the local police in many respects, and that was known before. I think we quantified it, so there was no surprise there. But I think what was surprising is that when we did ask uh, uh, our participants about the job they think the police is doing in general terms in protecting communities, they gave them uh, a more positive than negative result. It was fairly favorable. And I think that was uh, perhaps a bit of a surprise because uh, I think it's, it's probably easy to assume that because of the negative treatment that uh, black people have experienced, that they may be dismissive of the police's role, generally speaking. And our research showed very clearly that's not the case. People are making an important distinction between the broad role of police and the treatment of black people. And so I think that's a very useful and constructive uh, uh, insight, but one I wasn't expecting to see. Excellent. And uh, actually, I, although I said we had one last question and I used my prerogative, uh, yeah. one of our participants did get in just under the wire. So if you, guys right. have, if you folks have a minute or two. Absolutely. The, the, the final question is, were there any issues related to self-identification or concerns about anonymity? And if so, how were those addressed? For example, for a work-related survey, some folks may be hesitant to self-identify as black out of fear of reprisal. Well, I think that's a good question. Um, and, and that is an issue we were very mindful of. Um, I think probably uh, it's probably fair to say that there may have been some individuals who declined to participate in the survey out of that concern, and, and we had to respect that. Uh, but um, I think we did many things to try and give assurance to our participants that their anonymity would be protected. I think part of it is the organizations that were involved, the, the uh, presentation of the research as being being done by the community. Uh, our, our, our outreach staff, our interviewers were all people from the community. They were all black. Um, and we made a lot of effort to establish a sense of trust. Uh, we were given all the participants, the, 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 intervie the interviewers and the staff were all trained. Uh, participants were given a release form and, and information about the study in advance. They could read about it. They could read about what the study is about, what was going to be used for, um, and how their anonymity would be protected. So I think they could appreciate the fact that we were taking some serious steps to, to address that, take that seriously. Uh, the project was reviewed and approved by the Research Ethics Board at Ryerson University. Um, and all of the work of our institute uh, operates under not only federal legislation, but uh, uh, research industry standards uh, to protect confidentiality and anonymity. And uh, so we took very strong steps to make sure that identities would not be revealed in any way through the data or any of the information that we, um, uh, that we used. That being said, we asked at the very end of the survey, if individuals would have any interest in participating in future projects that might be done. And very pleased to say that 85% of our participants agreed to that. And so they did leave up their name and contact information in a secure place uh, should further research be done. But that is uh, being protected in a very deep vault. Excellent. Well, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Marva. So Len, I just have one comment for for you regarding you had asked about um, the the study being posted on on your website, and if you post the link um, from our uh, from our website from the Black Experience Project.ca, you will also be posting the video that's along with that, and it's a 17 minute long video that was sent out to participants. So for those who haven't had a chance to watch it. It's well worth watching, and that would be the version that would probably um, be 
most impactful, I think, uh, for for you to post. Yes, it's different than the four-minute one that we started with. Yeah. It's a different video. Okay, well, this, this has been great. Uh, Marva, Keith, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to share this information with us. And I also want to thank the, uh, the folks who joined our uh, webinar, uh, who posed questions and who listened patiently uh, for, through this very interesting and very important presentation. Thank, thank you all. Have a great day and the very best of the holiday season to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Len. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye-bye.